So this is standard stuff. This is the kind of stuff that we do as a technology company. We look for ways to expand the vision. We look for ways to filter the vision. Now there's another more esoteric side of this conference title, Seeing Into Believing, that I'm going to talk about now. Now this is the conversation that's happening in college now. This is the kind of far out stuff that we're thinking about. And as I said, you're smart people, and I want you to hear this because it's pretty cool. So seeing into believing what believing might be. We actually have these kinds of conversations. It's kind of like a dorm room. What, what is this stuff, belief and knowledge? Come on. <laughs> well, here's the standard idea. The standard idea is that we have sensory impressions. We collect sensory impressions all the time. You're staying in a hotel. You decide, you have a belief that you're going to be safe if you open up the door and walk down to the conference. You've done it before. Yet another sensory impression reinforces the belief that you're safe if you open up the door. And you open up the door, and of course, and there you, this uh, a little odor of the exhalations of the rest of the guests in the evening and so on. But other than that, you're safe and you come down to the conference and everything is fine. So you have this belief and reinforced by sensory impressions. And then after a while, the belief gets so strong, you've done it for so many years, you say, hey, look, I know I'm fine. If I just open my door, I get down there in time, have a nice breakfast, listen to Wollstone talk, it's all cool. Now, there's a guy who's very interesting, Richard Feynman. He was the smartest guy in the room. Most of the other scientists said that at the Manhattan Project. Richard Feynman also got a Nobel Prize. Now, with respect to science, he had an idea that we think is important at CollegeNet. His idea with respect to science was this. He said, scientific knowledge is a body of statements of varying degrees of certainty, some most unsure, some nearly sure, but none absolutely certain. I think that's a really important idea with respect to innovation. So what is knowledge? What's that little box that I showed before, where I showed these sensory impressions, I show belief, and that gets converted into knowledge? Knowledge is what we believe won't or can't change. I mean, come on, if I drop this, it's going to hit the podium, right? That's, that's what I believe. That's what I think knowledge is. It's the stuff that's not going to change. But what if it could change? So we have, with knowledge, a bet on immutability. We have a bet that what we believe to be knowledge will continue to be useful and applicable. That's a bet. That's a bet that we make. But look at this. There's a little bit of a problem here. What if a sensory impression shows up that doesn't convert or support our belief and doesn't support our knowledge? What if something shows up that's different, the aberration? Could that occur with respect to any piece of knowledge? Now, I think it's not pious to believe that it can't happen. Because to say that it can't happen is tantamount to say, I know what God would do. God could change the laws of physics, right? It's probably not going to happen. I'm pretty convinced it won't. But what if it happens? And we can have all kinds of things happen in our world that we don't expect. So what about this box of knowledge? Is this a safe place to be? Well, the rate of change in our world is accelerating. We all know it. Change is happening faster and faster and faster and faster. And so therefore, the context by which we decide that something is true or false is itself increasingly at risk. The technology we use continues to change. The processes change. The faces at the conference change, and so on. <clears throat> Now, this idea of Feynman's, which I think is very important with respect to innovation, is actually a very, very old idea. It goes back to the ancient Greeks. The ancient Greeks, there was a group that was, you know, you've heard, of course, Plato, Aristotle, and so on. But what about this group of so-called skeptics? There was a group of thinkers in ancient Greece, and they really didn't get much play or airtime because their idea was very, very subtle. Their idea was that there is no such thing as certainty in knowledge. Now, we think of the word skeptic as just simply doubting. I say, I'm skeptical of that. I don't believe it. Yeah, right, Garrett, you took the car, and you, you were out to 2 a.m. because you had car problems. OK, sure, buddy. <laughs> That's called skepticism in our modern lexicon. But skepticism in the Greek lexicon is just an overarching idea that knowledge of the idea of certainty in knowledge is not possible. Now, that idea was crushed. 
It was crushed because something happened 400 years ago in the French Academy. There were some students who found out about these skeptics, and they used it or tried to use it as an excuse for not doing any, any work or engaging in the academics. They said, look, you guys are fooling yourselves. You say that you teach us knowledge. It's inscribed on the building of the institution. It's inscribed truth and so on. This is not true. If you look at what the Greeks told us, they were the wise people. They were the people who said there wasn't any certainty. What are you doing saying you're going to teach us knowledge? There's nothing that's certain. And so they sort of put their arms up on the table and said, show them. So along comes Rene Descartes, this fabulous thinker. You know, you know about Cartesian coordinates from your old algebra days, right? That's Rene Descartes. Rene Descartes' job, he, he was worried, like the other faculty at the institution, he was worried about what do we do about these renegades, these people that don't believe in truth, that don't believe in knowledge. They won't engage. We need them. We need, this is our future. So he set about to think. He did a thought experiment, as he often did. Did many intuitive, very important works. And he came up with this idea that he thought was immutable, unassailable. And to this day, it's important in much of the thinking that's still done among scientists. And that is cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. There's no way that you can disagree with that, he said. There's no way that you can to prove to me that that's wrong. I mean, it looks to me like my hand's out here and my skin's here, but and if ev there's some evil deceiver that's running the whole show here, and my brain is really in a vat, and I think I've got hands here, uh, and I really don't, it doesn't matter because I think. And if I think, I exist. That's indubitable, unassailable. Well, take a look at this sentence. Does anybody know what this means? Some of you may speak Russian. <laughs> well, I don't, I'm not ready to say that this statement is unassailable because I don't know what it means. I have no clue. I've got to figure out what these words mean. I've got to figure out that this means I, this means M. I have to get to some agreement as to what existence is, what M is, what I is. I have to know what these words are. For me to say I agree with you about even the meaning of words is not some kind of concrete knowledge. It's based upon agreement. This is cogito ergo sum in Russian, you see? But I'm not ready to embrace it because I've got to figure out what these words mean. Maybe there's a shade of meaning that's a little bit different. I have to get a grip on what these words happen to mean. So modern philosophers aren't as keen as uh, Descartes was on the unassailability of his idea of cogito ergo sum. But this was a problem. The world would be a very different place if René Descartes did not have his way. Because what it did was it set off this wave of certainty in science that, OK, we've, we've got to figure it out that there's one certain thing, there's all, a bunch of certain things. We can even get down to certainty in terms of human behavior, for heaven's sakes. And that was the case of, of the early behaviorists. They believed that that was possible. Well, at the early part of the 20th century, there were some mathematicians who published a book called And the End of Certainty, where they were starting to see aberrations in the basic foundation of mathematics itself, which is the king of sciences, you see? So there's a bunch of uh, mathematicians and scientists who now believe that the idea of certainty is questionable. That fundamentally, it all boils down to assumptions. Now, what's beautiful about this, what's beautiful about this is if you can doubt assumptions, you can start looking at assumptions. You can start looking at knowledge. You can start saying, hmm, I take for granted that X, Y, Z. Maybe X, Y, Z isn't the case, or maybe there's a different way of looking at it. And I'm going to show you a couple of things that we're looking at at CollegeNet right now. I don't know if it's going to produce any opportunities for us in terms of products, but I think it's kind of fun to think about. So here's another thing that uh, 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 Feynman said. He said, doubting the great Descartes was a reaction I learned from my father. Have no respect whatsoever for authority, forget who said it, and instead look at what he starts with, where he ends up with, and ask yourself, is it reasonable? And that's the way Feynman did science, okay? I think it's a great way to do innovation. Think about what happens with computer programming. Computer programming gets a bad rap. I remember I was a graduate student in computer science, and people would pigeonhole people in computer science as, oh, those hardworking guys that write computer code, and they're just a bunch of nerds. Right? But you know what? If you face a bug in a program, which all of you have faced, guess what? The A-plus among you, the A-plus programmers inside CollegeNet, know that no assumption can be safe. You have to attack the bug from a, from a 
from the same standpoint that Richard Feynman uh, attacks it. You have to say that anything I'm assuming, this is going to be a great opportunity because among these things I've written, I'm making a set of assumptions. I don't care what those assumptions are. None of them are now safe. I'm going to find that one assumption that I made that's incorrect. And once I find that assumption and I correct it, I will fix the bug. You see? So the most powerful thinkers in college and at the A-plus people are the ones that will not take anything for granted. They will not take any assumption for granted. And you know what's cool about that is sometimes you get down to weird things, that there's a problem with the compiler or the operating system. And you create this discovery, and your, your set of assumptions, your set of skills thereby improves because of the bug. So there's actually some deep philosophy that happens inside of the computer programmer's head. It's a great training ground for, for open-mindedness, for thinking about things in new ways, for, for shaking your own assumptions, for disagreeing with yourself. It's very powerful. And I don't think that's very well appreciated in this art, this art of computer science, this art of computer programming. OK, so future product opportunities. What are we thinking about now? If we're willing to go along with Feynman, and we're willing to go along with the Greek skeptics, and we're willing to question everything, we're willing to go along with the A-plus programmers and say, I don't care what it is. It could be wrong. What about some of these ideas? Now, I'm going to give you just a couple of things that we're talking about. You may have other common assumptions that you're making that you want to talk to us about, that you're making at your institution with respect to our product and so on, out of which we might have insights and opportunity. But here's one we talk about. A common reasonable assumption is you don't understand me. Have you ever gotten this rejoinder? Sometimes your, your husband or your wife, you're really trying your best to, to get along, or your girlfriend, or your, and and they're mad at you, and they say, you just don't understand me. And you feel bad because you make a second assumption. We all make this second assumption, at least I do. I should understand you. I should understand you. You see? Well, guess what? That's harder to do than we think. We're precluded from understanding another person in ways that we don't necessarily appreciate. How many people here think, how many of you, be honest, think you're better than the average driver. Raise your hand. OK? Oh, this is really interesting. You know why this is interesting? Because I've, this, this, is, this crowd is not a hand raiser crowd. That's one thing I've got from this. Because you know what? And I, it's possible that you defy the averages here. Because when they do research and they ask this question, 93% of Americans say that they're better than the average driver. Now, here we only had like about 17%, or maybe 17.5%. Now, it's possible because people in college net are, who are customers are smart people. You're all very smart people, and you're a little cautious. Where is he going with this? And I don't want to get trapped, you see? So I appreciate that. But let me just say that if in your calmer moments, you probably think you're better than average. Well, if 93% of people think that they're better than average, and the average is 50%, wait a minute. And you say, I don't understand you. If you tell me I'm a bad driver, I'm going to say, you don't understand me. I'm a great driver. Because we don't understand ourselves. OK? The second thing is, <clears throat> well, we understand ourselves about a lot of things. But there's certain things we don't. It's very difficult to understand yourself. But most importantly, there's a lack of language for communicating our self-understanding. Now, to get an idea of how this works, do you remember the time that you recorded your first voicemail? Anybody here remember that? OK. Didn't it seem weird when you listened to it? Huh? That's me? Or when you saw yourself on video for the first time, didn't that seem strange? Well, there's a disconnect between inner performance and what the rest of the world sees. Now, think about this. That's why there's all these instructors for golf and, and tennis and, and piano and music. Uh, <clears throat> when you actually perform a function, an athletic function, there's feedback, there's feelings that you can't describe in words. The word feeling doesn't cut it. There's something going on four-dimensionally when you're hitting a golf ball. It's not just three dimensions. It's got to do with timing. It's got to do with position that are very difficult to understand yourself and to explain to other people. And that's because we rely upon English. We rely upon video. Video is part of instruction now. That's technology. But why do we continue to believe that we're going to be able to explain ourselves to other people by English or by Russian or by Latin. Well, 
there's got to be some better language for inner performance. How is it when I play the piano that it, my fingers kind of know what's going on? I don't understand that. What if there was a way through technology or sensors, whether it's got to do with tactile uh, sensation, it's got to do with audio, it's got to do with something I don't understand yet. What if there's some technology that lets us understand ourselves better and communicate with other people in a way that's better? I think that's a wide open, very interesting possibility, something that we're discussing at CollegeNet. <clears throat> Is there another language we can invent that will help us better understand and explain ourselves to others? Well, here's another idea. So that's one idea. And this is a second idea I'll leave you with this morning. And that is that I have this notion about the way time works, right? I think there's a past, I think there's a present, and I think there's a future. And I've thought that way ever since I've been a kid. I still think that way. <coughs> but maybe that's not a, the most powerful conceptualization. The past, we leave it. Whatever was happening this morning at breakfast, it's out there as a past, and if we had the technology, we could travel to it, we could experience it again. That great reception that we had last night, we could do it again. It exists out there in the past, in some kind of mysterious way. And since we have this kind of intuition about the way time works, we buy into movies like Back to the Future. There's all sorts of popular fare that talks about time travel. It's just a problem of getting the technology that lets us travel back into the past. That's what we think. Well, this notion of back to the future, this notion of time travel, we wouldn't buy it at all. We would, nobody would buy a ticket to this movie if they believed that time works in a different way. Now, here's, here's my thought. My thought is that we have the past. We generate artifacts. Those artifacts exist in museums. They exist in newspapers. They exist in photographs. And <laughs> then we go to the future. Well, what if the past doesn't exist in the way we think it exists? What if the past is the artifacts, period? Now, I have no counter, counter uh, to this notion at this point. If you have a counter to this, I'm very interested to know, because it's something I'm thinking about right now. If you can show me that some, when you sit here and you think about last night's reception, that you're not tapping some artifact, if you can prove to me that you're not tapping some artifact, the artifact being the memory that you have in your head or some photograph that Lauren took, if you can prove to me that you're not in the present looking at some artifact, I'm very interested to know what that is. And until I see that, I think it's worth considering the possibility that the past is actually inside the present in totality in the form of the artifacts. And this opens up some very interesting possibilities for innovation. What is a picture? Well, here's some pictures from the Great Depression. We see these pictures of the Great Depression, all right? But a picture is a way to convert what would otherwise be evanescent into the persistent. And so we have some persistence here. We can actually see these younger men, and we can see the signs that they are holding, and so on. This is the past. We also have a newspaper. It's the past. It's a snapshot of the way somebody opined on the events of the day. That is the past. If we were going to look at the Depression, we'd go to the artifacts. We'd look at the artifacts. What's happening in Facebook? Now, I kind of think it's 1984, really, because Facebook tells you they're connecting us, and it's beautiful. They're connecting the world. But actually, they don't make any money by connecting us. They don't charge people to communicate with each other. They make money from the artifacts that are being generated by this whole set of billions of people, well, hundreds of millions of people, who are now social historians. They don't know it. What they're doing, these kids are all preoccupied. They're taking pictures. They're putting up their photos. They're saying things about what they're doing. They're putting this all in Facebook's data banks. And data banks makes its deal with the NSA. And of course, they sell it to all the advertisers. That's how they make their money. So the action that's occurring here is that the, the child, the person, whoever's involved with Facebook is actually being marshaled as a free social historian to put up information, to actually aggregate the artifacts of the past. Now, under this different idea where the past is entirely contained in the present, that's all it is. We can't go back to the, the past. If we do so, it's into the artifacts. The past can be changed. Now, here's another assumption we make. Oh, you can't cry over spilled milk. It's happened. There's nothing you can do about it. Well, what is it? If it is the artifacts, 
Theoretically, you could do something about the past. You could change it. In fact, historians do change the past because they change the artifacts. They look at the artifacts. They look at old documents. They look at old pictures. They come up with new conclusions, and they put forward new theories. So they don't just examine the past. They actually change and augment the past. More people are historians under this model than at any time in human history. There's a lot of historians in this room because there's a lot of folks that are writing emails, putting stuff on databanks, including me. I'm a historian. I take pictures with my phone. I'm a historian. I didn't know that. <laughs> the past is constantly and rapidly growing. That's interesting because most folks, including me, think the past is out there. It's immutable. It can't be changed. I could travel back to it someday in the future. Won't that be cool? No, I don't think that anymore. I think that the past is something I'm changing all the time by virtue of the recordings and so on that I create. The past is unsafe, thereby, from destruction or erosion. I'll show you why. And the past is thus more precious and vulnerable. So we have this kind of security that, all right, if things go wrong with the database, we can at least go back to the past somewhere. We kind of have this intuition that the past is out there in this immutable way. Well, no, if it's not, if it's all the artifacts, it's, it's not secure. <laughs> and the vulnerability of the past owes to entropy. If the artifacts is, are the past, if the artifacts is what's in your mind, in your photograph, in your documents, if that's where the past lives, all of these are phys physical representations. And everything that's uh, physical is uh, subject over deep time to entropy. This stage will disappear in 100, 200 years. It'll somehow be demolished or thrown on the junk pile. That's, that's the second law of thermodynamics. So that applies to all of these artifacts. That applies to the past itself. So if we care about the past, which of course we do because we learn things from the past, we better think differently about protecting it. There's also the problem of the copying effect. If I have a memory about last night's reception, which I do, fond memories, wonderful time, how am I going to protect that from my death? All right, I'm going to die. At least I make that assumption. But so far, so good. Uh, in any event, how do I protect that? Well, I copy it. I transcribe it. I, I write some notes. And if I do that, even if I have a pure copy and I use a copy machine, there's a copying effect. If you copy the copy, if you copy the copy, the copy, the copy, eventually it becomes mud. That's the copying effect. So that's dangerous with respect to this conceptualization of the past. And we also have the increasing rate of obsolescence and incompatibility with the media through which we construct the past. Now, I've constructed plenty of past in my old Blackberry. And a couple of years ago, I gave it up for an Android. I have it in my pocket here. It hasn't buzzed me yet, which is great. And I have it up in my kitchen cabinet. I saw it the other day. And I realized, well, I've got all those cool pictures on there. How am I going to get them off? I mean, how many of you have, have problems like that, where you have this old uh, machine, or you have this old phone, or you have this old camera? I think it's way worse than it was 15 years ago. I mean, I have old pictures that are in an album, right? And there's a little bit more persistence with those, because the media is, is still intact, even though they're a little browned and a little ragged on the edges, at least I can see the images. The images have disappeared from a lot of the machines that I've used to record them. And of course, we have the other important problem, and that's exploitation by third parties. The fact that when we decide, OK, we're going to make this safe, because we do have this problem of, of persistence and obsolescence, we're going to put this up on the cloud. Well, what are these folks going to do with the cloud? And we've read about that in the news. So finally. We have a burgeoning past, if we can willing to conceptualize the past in this way. It's the burge burgeoning conversion of the evanescent into the persistent. Cre and this creates new and higher value, another opportunity for innovation, on evanescence. We take it for granted that we can do something, and it's been one of technology's efforts to create persistence around what was otherwise evanescence. Well, maybe this starts to flip. Maybe it becomes important to have experiences and events that are evanescent, that evanescent is actually valuable. I mean, it's good to forget stuff, OK? There's a product opportunity. There's innovation opportunity there. And a good example, early example of this is Snapchat. Snapchat's out there. People can take a picture. It gets to the, the recipient, and it disappears after two seconds or so. Very interesting idea. So these are ideas. As co-CEO, you're already co-CEO because you're involved with me in this circle of innovation. And I've shared with you some of the conversation that happens at CollegeNet. It's very interesting. 
I hope that you use some of these ideas, that you open your mind to different assumptions with respect to our products. And if you have any ideas, that you talk to us, because we're very interested. Thank you for listening.